I have a 10 minute text with no pictures, no burning mobs with Molotov cocktails standing behind me like they seem to be with Ashbury, but uh, um, bear with me on that. And my little uh, text is called Old Rope. Last week I went to a restored paper mill in a tiny village in the middle of Sweden. I was there to meet a bunch of people who'd been given a uniquely challenging task. Make the bedroom and bathroom products sold globally by a famous home furnishing giant sustainable. When I say that their task is as challenging, think of it this way. I learned from the flat pack wardrobes guys or packs team that if you were to stack one year's production of their pre-assembled wardrobes onto flatbed trucks, the line would stretch nose to tail from Sweden to Beijing. That's a lot of wardrobes. Uh, and spare a thought for the poor guy in the car park in Beijing frantically trying to assemble them all. <laughs> now, these PAX guys, I learned, are obsessive in their search for ways to reduce the resource use of their products. It's cause for celebration at PAX HQ when someone discovers a laminate that's a few milligrams lighter per meter than the one it replaces. One of the Paxmen explained their missionary zeal. A milligram here, a milligram there, it actually really adds up by the time you reach Beijing. I heard similar stories too from the Mirror team. They source three million square meters of the stuff every year. So too with the bed team and the mattress team. For ineffable Swedish reasons, the bed team and the mattress team don't talk to each other, but anyway, whatever. <laughs> they are collectively united in a mission to find lighter, cleaner products and materials across the whole of their enormous range. It doesn't stop with the staff in Sweden. The, the firm requires each of its suppliers to follow a strict code of conduct, and we're talking hundreds of firms in more than 50 countries. 85 auditors carry out nearly a thousand supplier audits every year, most of them unannounced. If a supplier does not conform, however big they are, they're out. And the products are just one part of the story. Every new store, office, distribution center, or factory that the company opens is located, equipped, and operated to be the most sustainable facility of its kind in the world at that point in time. 150 of the firm's mega stores will soon be powered by solar panels. Every cup of coffee uh, served at every store is certified organic. This company-wide effort has been accelerating for 20 years. They've taken the lead out of the mirror glass. They've removed the chromium from the table legs. They've taken toxins out of the paint. They've replaced the PVC that used to be in wallpapers. There's no more formaldehyde in their textiles. The paper in their catalogues, chlorine-free. They've even taken volume out of the mattresses, for goodness sake. They roll them up to reduce the impacts of shipping them from one place to another. We're talking hundreds, thousands of improvements right across the board. And they're all written down on an official list without end. But there's one small thing that they have not done and that's to take the keys out of those flat bed trucks. Quite the contrary. The company is already huge, as you may have guessed. It's on course to double in size in the next few years. The number of customers visiting their giant said sheds will increase from 650 million customers now, today, to 1.5 billion per year by 2020. Growth on such a scale is hard to imagine. Think of that line of trucks already today stretching from here to Beijing. By 2020, the line will be twice as long again. It'll come all the way back to Sweden. There'll be nowhere to park in Stockholm. They'll all be filled with trucks filled with flat pack wardrobes. <laughs> the senior manager bearing this news told her colleagues that what all this growth was for. With this growth, she said, will achieve the economies of scale needed to reduce costs. That's important to the mission of our company because we want our products to be available to the many and not just to the few. Growth is needed above all, the manager explained, 
to finance all the sustainability improvements we need to make in the future. Now, there's a small problem with this narrative, and it's best explained if I talk about wood. The company sells around about 100 million pieces of furniture every year, and is therefore, not surprisingly, at least the third largest user of wood in the world. It takes its sustainability of its supply seriously. The company has promised that by 2017, half of all the wood that it uses will either be recycled or come from forests that are certified to be responsibly managed in ways that avoid the excessive use of chemicals and water. Wow, 50%. That's a vast amount of responsible wood. But it does somewhat beg the question, what about the second half of all that wood? As the company doubles in size, that second pile of wood, the uncertified half, the unreliably sourced half, will soon be twice as big as all the wood that the company uses today. The impact on the world's forests of just one company's ravenous hunger for resources will be devastating. Along with similar teams and companies all over the world, I'm just using this one as an example, the gifted and committed people that I met in Sweden last week are confronted by an awful dilemma. However hard they work, however many innovations they come up with, the impact of their firm's activities on living systems that have evolved over billions of years will be even greater in a few years' time than it is today, and all because of compound growth. This chilling prospect cannot be blamed on evil owners. This company has healthy trees almost literally in its blood. Its founder grew up on a farm surrounded by trees. He was born in the same village as Carl Linnaeus, one of the fathers of modern uh, ecology and botany. His company's products are named to this day after the lakes, rivers, and bays that he knew as a boy. There's no way that this man or the many people who work for him would mindfully do harm to the land that they love. But I stress mindfully, because what I'm looking at here is a complete the separation of thought and deed. What is going on? Standing outside that old factory last week with the colleagues from the sustainability teams, I tried to imagine myself in the founder's shoes. What would it be like to read after my whole life's work of building up this amazing enterprise, to read about the heavy criticism about logging and clear-cutting of old-growth forests in the north of Russian Karelia. How would I react to so many complaints that thousands of unique and rare species of lichens and mosses and other plants and animals have been endangered at this moment by our activities? My first reaction, I guess, I was trying to put myself into his place, would be indignation. Do these protesters and complainers have any idea how much work we've done over 20 years to make our products greener? Do they have any idea how much work we've done to put certification procedures in place, often, as in Russia, in tricky and difficult situations where institutional situations are already weak? My second reaction, I anticipated, would be to suspect that these ghastly charges were probably true. The business has become so huge. There's so much money at stake for so many people. And those forests and Russia just by themselves are miles away. How is one realistically to police and to fulfill the promises we made through the certification process? And then I thought that I hope my third reaction would be, if I were the founder of such a company, would be outrage turning to steely resolve. No way would I tolerate a company that I had started taking on a baleful life of its own like this. I'd say enough, stop the cutting, we're going to find another way. I was nervous, I would confess about this paper, and you've heard that everyone you prepared it, I thought it was going to be just a solid dose of we can fix it. There's been quite a lot of that this afternoon, but this morning I thought it was a lot more nuanced reservation about the scale of the kind of questions that we need to confront. Thomas's uh, story about the Olympic Hall then go back to basics. Don't just kind of make a bit more of the same. Rethink the question. Don't just, you know, 
fiddle around with the solutions. And that absolutely amazing story from Ben about government services. Don't just kind of tip things into a digital pot. Rethink the nature of the activity that you're there to redesign. And we heard this morning Charles uh, Ledbetter talking about empathy for humans. The elements are there dotted around today's discussions for the kind of nature of the response we might make to this absolutely uh, awful problem of compound growth which is so built into the system. So I want to just finish by concluding on the scope of what that can mean. Not just empathy for other people, but for the living systems that upon which we all depend. Going back to that huge Swedish firm, the one with the blue shirts, what could I do? I don't think it's complicated. What I would do is arrange for everybody in that firm to spend time quietly in an old growth forest. No lectures, no training, just the opportunity to experience the natural energy of a living system that has evolved in its place over thousands of years. Very likely, I'd encourage people to learn about forestry practices that we know about that can accelerate natural processes of restoration. I'd ask my people to pay thoughtful attention to the fallen trees and the dead wood and to wonder how can it be that these are the wealth, these are the life of an old growth forest. Very likely, again, I'd encourage people to learn about the different ways that natural interventions can restore uh, ecosystems and plantations, whilst at the same time support their use to deliver certain amounts of resources. <coughs> That's all it would take. Just the opportunity to set aside quietly. I'm sure, I don't know whether the plan is gonna do this, once people are given the space and the quiet to reconnect with the Earth's ecological system, and empathize with them, as with people, the very idea in that situation of destroying a living system in the interest of economic growth, it would be inconceivable. Thank you.